So Russia is still the imperialist power. Russia, it's not just Ukraine. They want to expand their borders. Uh, if not physically, they want to expand them in terms of authority and influence. So what we need is strong narratives. And if you have a strong narrative, you are very resistant against disinformation. If you know what you believe, if you understand what's going on, then when somebody gives you a false story, you wash it away. The reason these nations want to join NATO is because they're afraid of Russia. Information is a weapon. Um, and that the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and the Russians, and so on, they all use information as a way of shaping the battlefield. Hi everyone, my name is Vladislava Skorohod and you're watching a series created by Ukrainer in English where we talk to journalists, academics and experts from different fields and countries about their perspective on Ukraine, Russian invasion and its global impact. And today you have a chance to look at Ukraine through the eyes of Mark Leite. Mark Leite is NATO's former leading expert on strategic communications, who retired as communications director for SHAPE, NATO's main military headquarters. Former journalist at BBC for over 20 years and founder of Stratcom Academy. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. We're recording this interview at the Royal Air Force Club in London today. Why it's important to record it here? I think it's symbolic of uh, part of my nation's history, which has a lot of military in it. Uh, the RAF was formed in our greatest times of struggle, um, but also for me personally, it has a very special meaning as a member because my father was in the Royal Air Force in the Second World War and he was in Bomber Command, um, flying as a rear gunner in Lancaster's and we're in the Lancaster room today, and Bomber Command took enormous losses in the Second World War. Um, of the 125,000 people who served in Bomber Command, 55,000 died. Overall, 75,000 people were killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. So that shows, I think, the cost and the required cost of major war for my country that was an existential conflict, and my father played his part in it. As a very young man, his first combat mission was just after he was 20. And I think this shows what is needed um, in Ukraine and any other country fighting for its survival, just as my father did. And what was the conscription age back uh, then in Britain? It was 18. Um, and um, my grandfather, also served in the uh, Second World War, and he was in his late 30s at the beginning of the war, and he was called up as well, and he served uh, in the Royal Navy and received medals for gallantry. Um, the war, the Second World War and the First World War, um, involved conscription of all our young people, from 18 upwards, some nations it was 21, but basically when you're in an existential conflict, it's all in. And it was very significant that most of the people who died, those 55,000 people who died, most of them were in their late teens or early 20s. Um, and they were volunteers, but they could have been conscripted into the army, they could have been conscripted into the navy. And it is the nature, if you're in a long attritional conflict, which the Second World War was, which Ukraine is, then it's inevitable that you need a lot of people, not so that you can shovel everyone to the front line, but so that you have rotation, training, leave, rest, um, and that not everyone needs to be called up at once, because what you've got is a situation where you cannot predict the end of a war. So conscription, and I'm speaking as a former BBC defence correspondent and a former NATO um, person for over two decades, conscription is a standard way for fighting major conflicts over long periods and inevitably has called in people from 20 upwards and increasingly females as well. And if you're having a long war with attrition, that's the way it's got to be. Could you walk me through the late 1930s and remind me how the British appeasement policy occurred and where it brought us? 
Um, it occurred because of a number of reasons. First of all, um, in Britain, they didn't want to go to war again. Um, there was a mood of, if you like, peace at a huge price. Secondly, the prime minister of the time bought into that. Um, the British defences, along with France, which is our main ally, were also very weak. We'd spent 10 years or more downgrading them. So we felt weak. And as a result, when you had a rising aggressive power like Germany, there was a desire to appease them, to avoid a war. And we comforted ourselves that Hitler didn't really want to be what we now know he was, and that if we just gave him this, or if we did a deal here, it would be all over. But the issue was, was of course, every time we gave Hitler something, he saw it as weakness and wanted more. So, in fact, far from appeasing him to stop, it actually encouraged him to go on. And what then happened is that every time we gave him something, he got stronger. And at the same time, we were not rearming very quickly, so we weren't getting stronger. So our relative weakness looked even worse. And when he ended up um, taking Czechoslovakia, he got a large army and a very, very capable defense industry, which enormously strengthened the Nazis. And that meant, meant that we were in a very poor position to fight him effectively. So the whole appeasement policy um, made things worse. The lesson from that is that if we had moved in harder on Hitler at the beginning when he was still weak, things might have been different. Russia was always relatively strong, but the lesson there is that we appeased him in Georgia in 2008. Um, our response was weak. Even worse, in 2014, we thought there was a way out, that somehow there was a peace in the middle. What we didn't do was read Putin right. Putin was not going to stop unless there was major power and force against him. Hitler wasn't going to stop unless we could force him to stop. So there is the mistake. History is never exactly the same. Never read history as an exact repetition. But it does rhyme. The wheel of history moves forward. It changed the context. The context of the time is valuable. Appeasement only works if the person you're trying to appease is reasonable. Putin is not reasonable. He is obviously not reasonable. He wasn't reasonable back in the early 2000s. And yet we kept thinking we could do a deal with this man. We couldn't and we can't. In 1935, there was a general election in Britain, and the Labour Party used the slogan, armament mean war, vote for Labour. They positioned their policies against the dictatorship, yet refused to vote for more arms. Ninety years later, it's still often said that there are no votes in defence. Do you agree? And if so, why? Well, I think it's true that, I mean, I wouldn't just point the finger at Britain here. I think that there are very few votes in defence in most major democracies. If you ask people what they want their money spent on, they want it spent on education and health and so on. And, and who can blame them? Um, the problem is that the first duty of any government is security. Um, and the first duty of any government, too, is to tell truth to its populace. It's very easy to go down the populist road. There's no votes in defence. Let's not talk about it. Let's not give money to defence. Um, and that's a mistake, uh, a big mistake. Now, the current Labour Party is very different to the one then, but the comparison is valid in the sense that there's often people who think that if you spend money on defence, you are somehow warmongering. Actually, no. The, nat the nature of NATO, the nature of the Western nations, is deterrence. And there's two ways you deter, followed by a third. The first way you deter is with willpower, your capability. Are you able to defend yourself? Do you have enough weapons? And then you have to have 
the willpower to use it. Um, to say to the enemy, we have the means, we have the will. And then they are deterred. And the third thing that you need is you need communication. They need to realize that you have that will and you have that capability. And we have failed in that. And you have seen that the consequence, especially in, in Russia, where they believed that we were weak and that therefore they could play around with us. So their perception of our weakness encouraged them to carry on doing what they're doing. They were mistaken. We had given them good calls. We had not behaved well. We had not behaved with strength. But when the second invasion of Ukraine happened, well, we reacted very, very well. But if only we had shown that will and capability in 2015, then would 2022 have happened? I think not. So those are the lessons that you need. You cannot deter somebody unless you've got the means. And we are now going to spend an awful lot of money on defense. Um, and if you go back to the Second World War, Britain was still a very powerful country in 1939. In 1945, we were a bankrupt nation. Why? Because we had to spend all that money on defense. In the end, it would have been cheaper to build up our forces in the 30s and not wait until the 1939 and 1940 when we had to spend all our money and all our resources to, uh, to fight an existential threat. So it is an easy argument to make. Oh, let's not waste money on that. Let's build schools. But in the end, we're a democracy and we need to defend democracy and that requires deterrence and that requires weapons. Do you think the West has woke up? Yes, I think it has. Whether it's woken up enough is, is an argument in the sense that um, after the end of the Cold War, um, we had the so-called peace dividend and the downsizing of defense was huge. I mean, absolutely massive. Um, and therefore, our ability to build up from where we are now has got a slow start. And I think that's the problem, is that we now have far too few armaments factories, far too too ammunition factories. So we say, okay, we're going to have a lot more ammunition. But where are the factories? Are the factories big enough? And the answer is they're not. So actually, we need to front end a lot of spending. So you're seeing a lot of nations are upping the defense spending, but actually the amount of money we need to invest or is almost an emergency crisis response because we actually need to build up the means to produce the weapons and also the systems that we can take people and, and train them and so on. So yes, we've woken up. Yes, we've started. You know, are we accelerating enough? And I would say at the moment we're not. And what is your response to those who say that supporting Ukraine or not agreeing to the immediate peace plan is warmongering? Well, it's absurd. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, you have to... The Russians, and we'll come back to that later, have a completely false narrative about why they are doing what they're doing. Um, this is an aggressive attack on a neighboring country with zero justification. So if people say, well, we should have peace, on what terms? Are you saying, well, we should just give in to Russia? I don't think they are. People often fool themselves. They somehow think that peace is always the way. Well, peace might always be the way at the end, but you've got to get to a fair peace. Um, you know. The most peaceful places in the country are graveyards, but you don't want to live in them. Um, so warmongering suggests that there is an aggressive intent on the part of Ukraine and its allies. The facts show you that the invasion came from Ukraine. Uh, from Ukraine, oh, right, I'll do that bit again, you'll cut that. The, fact, the facts of the matter are very clear. The aggression came from Russia. They invaded Ukraine, not Ukraine invaded Russia. 
Um, the excuse that they give for it is so weak um, that it's almost laughable. But people seize on it because either they're Putin apologists or they don't believe um, in deterrence, and in which case they're unrealistic. Um, peace is not at any price. You want the right kind of peace. We want to live in a society where we have the freedom to vote. We have the freedom to make our own decisions, to have our own education, to have our children. That requires effort. So warmongering is a slipshod, casual and inadequate um, glib response, which will make Putin very happy, but no one else. And what are the main strategic narratives which the Kremlin uses to justify their military aggression or undermine the support for Ukraine? Uh, there's a series, um, often to different targets. The main one, which they use externally, is that Ukraine was a threat to them and that it's NATO expansion. Um, and this is simply untrue, and we can look at that in more detail if you wish. So that's their main narrative, is NATO is expanding, that Russia is threatened. Um, then there's a whole series of supporting narratives, some of them internal. To their own people, um, they are saying this is the return of Russia as a great power. So their internal narrative is often quite aggressive. And if you looked at their internal narrative and compared it to their external narrative, you can see in one they're saying to the, their own people, hey, Russia, rah, 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 we're coming back. We're restoring ourselves to power. And then externally they're saying, oh, we're the victim, we're threatened. But the two narratives are alongside each other. They also have a narrative for uh, the more neutral nations, say in Africa, which is to paint themselves as anti-imperialist and to paint the NATO powers as imperialists. And this has some traction because, of course, in um, Africa, it was countries like Britain and France, which were the colonizers. Although we are no longer the colonizers, we've gone. Russia is also an incredibly imperial power, but it mostly colonized its surrounding countries. Um, countries of which African countries or South America know very little. Why should they? But that means that they don't understand the history of Russia. History, is not, history would show Russia is not only a colonizer and imperial power, it still is, in a way that the former Western colonial powers are not. Uh, Russia is still meddling in very bad ways in all its neighbors, um, putting up you know, having countries, having sort of breakaway states, intervening, um, corrupting, all of these things. So Russia is still the imperialist power, but it's not seen, and they're playing a different card in Africa and places like that. Yeah, Putin often quotes Catherine the Great and say that uh, the only way to defend Russian borders is to expand them. And how do you think, how could the Ukrainian government use this in strategic communications? I think it needs to, I think it needs to, it needs to use that, that's for sure. Um, and I think that is understood in some of the immediate neighbors. You don't need to tell the Baltics that. Um, but I think there's a lack of realization amongst some of the more neutral nations or some of the far away nations that Putin's idols are Catherine the Great and Peter the Great. And they were expansionists. So when he talks, when he talks about what Russia wants, they shouldn't be thinking about an expansionist NATO. They should be looking at what he says internally to his own people and what he says in his speeches and use that to tell people you have to understand that Russia, it's not just Ukraine. They want to expand their borders. Uh, if not physically, they want to expand them in terms of authority and influence. Um, so I think that needs to be a key thing, to use their history against them. Um, not by making it up, but by demonstrating what Russia says. And that also then undermines the nonsense of the NATO expansionism.
um, which is very important to see. And if you look at then why NATO nations, the new ones in Eastern Europe, in the Baltics, want to be part of NATO, then look at what's happening. Um, if you look at the nations that are former Soviet Union, uh, Moldova, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, almost all of them, without fail, have major problems, Georgia, with breakaway states, disillusionment, um, disinformation, Russian influence. These are poor countries which are unstable, and Russia's interfering them all. Now let's take three former Soviet states, Lithuania, Estonia, you know, Latvia. and Latvia. Oh, what are they like? Are oh, they in the EU? They're stable, they're expanding. Two of them have massive Russian minorities. Are they being oppressed? No. So suddenly you've got the three nations of the former Soviet Union that are in NATO, thumbs up, things are pretty good. You look at the nations that aren't in Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, all the rest, Armenia. That's what Russia does when you're not in Ukraine, so when you're not in the Soviet Union. So no wonder nations want to be part of NATO. And it puts the lie to this idea that Moscow is threatened. The reason these nations want to join NATO is because they're afraid of Russia. And Russia has no cause to be afraid of them. Mr. Leite, could you remind us, please, why and when NATO was created and has its goal changed ever since? And uh, on your opinion, how do you think what is the value of NATO today? Um, so NATO was formed in 1949. We've just had the 75th anniversary. Um, and it was formed because of a realization among NATO, what became NATO nations, about the threat from Russia. Um, at the end of the Second World War, almost all of the nations dis disarmed themselves very rapidly. Um, Russia didn't. Stalin actually kept very much of the army going. Um, there was a whole series of struggles um, in various nations, in Greece, um, in the Czechoslovakia, in what became the Soviet bloc, um, where Russian influence was very malign. They were using communist parties in nations like France and Italy to try and undermine them. So there was a sense of enormous threat and a very obvious tank-based threat from the Soviet Union. And Russia was relatively strong. All of the nations were prostrate from all of the years of war. They had disarmed, they had no money. And fortunately, at that time, the United States had a group of people who recognized that for the safety of what we would call the Western world, they needed to stay involved in Europe. So Britain was a leading nation in getting this. It was banding together to defend themselves. Um, and that's still very important because if you look at the member states of NATO, virtually none of them would be able to defend themselves against a major attack. We're all too small. Britain was once a great power. Our armed forces couldn't do that now. But together, we're formidable. Um, together, we're a great military power. Separate, we can't do it. Um, therefore, the fundamental reason to get together was to get the power of everyone in one place, the United States in particular, because that is still a superpower. Um, and what's happened over the years is that NATO has evolved to different circumstances. So at the end of the Cold War, uh, NATO got involved in the Balkans because of the instability there. We got involved after terrorism and 9-11 because of the problems in Afghanistan. That hasn't ended well, but the reason we went was the fear of the threat of terrorism. NATO is now evolving again. It is, at the end of the Cold War, 
for a while we thought it was a kind of the end of history, that somehow things would never be that bad, Russia would be okay, we'd be okay, let's have a peace dividend. Now we've recognized that great power competition has not ended. In fact, it's being boosted, it's come back. And that as individual nations, the Netherlands, Britain, all of us, we're all too small. If we want to be a great power militarily, we're going to have to be all in one place, which is NATO. So we have now, if you like, almost returned to where we started, to be a basic deterrence organization with enough power to defend our borders. If it's all about the enlargement of NATO, then why do Russians steal and deport Ukrainian kids and citizens into the depths of Russia? Could you elaborate on, please, about how mass deportation of nations has been an age-old imperial tool of Russia? Um, because it's how they exert control. Um, let's say that the Russian people um, are they're very ambiguous in their views, almost cognitive dissonance. Russians often see themselves as victims, that everybody is against them. At the same time, their view of Russia is as a mighty power who everyone should respect. So they have, they're almost at war amongst themselves about, on one hand, everybody hates us and we're victims and poor Russia. And then on the other hand is mighty Russia, our wonderful culture, our wonderful language, our Ruski Mir. And this is a very unhealthy way of looking at the world to have that kind of cognitive dissonance. The reality is that Russia has always used its language and its culture and its people to try and control its surrounding nations. And one of the things they've done over the centuries is mass deportations. So very frequently when the Russians went into an area, they put their people in and took the local people out. And actually, this happened in the Tsarist times, but it, it became supercharged under Stalin. So you saw huge deportations, Moldova, um, Georgia, Crimea, uh, the Baltics, um, putting people in and pulling people out. So deportation is not just a bad thing to do, which it clearly is, but it's a means of policy. And I think it's very important that people understand this and that it should be used as a strategic communication message because a lot of people who may think, oh, it's just a war, oh, the Russians have a point, they actually need to understand, okay, if you think they have a point, why are they deporting all these people? Why are they doing exactly what they did in the Baltics, what they did in Moldova, what they did in Georgia, what they did elsewhere? And that will tell you that what Putin is doing is following through a imperialist policy, which is centuries old, but is also very clearly a copy of what happened under Stalin. And that shows who is the expansionist here and who is the victim. So the deportation policy is not just cruel and wrong and a war crime. It needs to be understood as part of how the Russians are trying to change the very nature of Ukraine. And how do you think, what is the Russian vision of war, and in particular, informational warfare? Well, that, that's a big question. There's, there's some different aspects to it. Um, Russia has, is almost proud of its ability to take enormous casualties. Um, and that's part of the Russian way of war is to be careless as to their own casualties. So you look at the First World War under the Tsars, the Second World War under Stalin, and now if you look at the Ukrainian war, where they're frankly quite happy to take casualties at a level that frankly no Western nation would or should. Um, so the Russian way of war is extremely expensive in human life and for reasons which would be a much longer discussion, the Russian people are able to tolerate it. And they're proud of their ability to tolerate uh, casualties. And my attitude is, well, that's all very well, 
but you should tolerate them in a good cause, not trying to invade a neighbor. Um, and if you look at the people who are so careless as to your people's lives, why are you supporting them? Beyond that, the Russians, um, like many nations, but they are in particular going to have a vision of political warfare. It goes under many different titles. If you look at the way that Stalin operated, there is the gray zone where you use information uh, as a means of control, as a means of propaganda, <coughs> as a means to confuse, and so on. And the Russians have thought about this an awful lot. So they use information warfare, and in, they, in their own policies, in their own doctrines, they talk a lot about how they actually use information. So social media, um, disinformation, um, suborning key individuals, corruption, all of these come together into um, what is often called information confrontation. And artificial intelligence, AI, the growth of um, social media has supercharged this. So if you look at how they did information warfare um, in the 50s and the 60s, it was radio and TV. Well, now you've got these extraordinarily powerful tools. And that's one area where we are really still lagging behind. We know the problem, but the weaponization of disinformation, the ability to flood the zone with bots and false information and so on, um, the ability to polarize societies is a big weapon, which is a major problem for the Western societies to cope with. That uh, naturally leads us to the next question that we often talk about resisting and countering uh, disinformation, like we always try to catch up with the enemy. How could Western messaging be more proactive and less reactionary? Well, it's a good point you make about being uh, proactive than reactive. Um, if a nation, if a opponent is prepared to lie, then trying to deal with them tactically, issue by issue, will always fail. So if you take an example, the shooting down the Malaysian airline over Ukraine, or the shooting down, or the um, attempted killing of um, the uh, Russian defector in Britain, in Salisbury, the Salisbury poisonings. As the truth became out, what the Russians did was they kept putting out new stories, new narratives, and they put out five, 10, 15, 20 different stories, basically just to muddy the waters. And this is a deliberate tactic. If you can't get people to believe you, get them to not believe anyone. And Hannah Arendt, a notable theorist about totalitarianism, highlighted the people most susceptible to totalitarian control are those who are confused and don't know the difference between true and false. So one of the things the Russians have done is they flood the zone with confusing stories. So people say, I don't know what to believe, so to hell with it. Um, so how do you overcome that? Well, you don't overcome it tactically. The truth about the Malaysian airliner shoot down um, is harder to prove than to just make up another lie. You can always lie faster than you can correct the lie. So a lot of it comes down to narrative, as the willingness to believe and to trust. Um, so when I give advice to people, I always say, what it, don't obsess about disinformation. If somebody doesn't trust you, they are vulnerable. So trust is the thing, and trust is based on many things, not just your credibility, but also your story, who you are. Trust comes from believing in a narrative, and we're all little story-making machines. So what we need is strong narratives. And if you have a strong narrative, you are very resistant against disinformation. If you know what you believe, if you understand what's going on, then when somebody gives you a false story, you wash it away. So the answer is strong, clear narratives, which are demonstrated by what you do as well as what you say. That's not easy, 
it's a lot it's the only thing that's going to work when somebody just is spouting out lies at a rate that you really can't answer. Mr. Leite, you were at the regions of the project that brought strategic communications at the heart of NATO. Could you tell us please which challenges did you meet back then and could you address the issue of ethical but still effective influencing campaigns in defense? Yeah, well th thank you for that. I I I'm proud that I played a part in getting strategic communication to be uh, taken very seriously in NATO. Um, when I first joined NATO, we tended to have, um, I think what I would now say is a quite a naive attitude and a very limited attitude to how we use public information. We had good public affairs officers, we had people who did psychological operations, but nothing linked together. And within the military in particular, um, strategic communications wasn't seen as very important. It was all about the weapons and so on. But what we saw in the um, 90s and then in the um, turn of the century and so on was that information is a weapon um, and that the Taliban, Al-Qaeda and the Russians and so on, they all use information as a way of shaping the battlefield. And we were way behind the curve. Um, we didn't have enough people, we didn't train them enough, we didn't think hard enough. And so myself and other people, we tried to change this. Um, and the leaderships came on board and now we have moved from a, moved from a sort of very basic position to one where strategic communications is doctrinally sound we have much more people, many more people doing it. It's a much more senior thing and our leaderships take it very seriously. So you cannot, you know, hearts and minds is a glib phrase, but we talked about um, the ability to do things. Capability is one thing, willpower is another. Willpower is driven by things like narrative, it's driven by understanding, it's driven by things that are going on inside people's head. That's strategic communications. You may have a gun, are you willing to use it? That's STRATCOM. So we have now got NATO into a position where strategic communication is regarded as very important. The Russians, in their uses of political warfare, had a much better instinctive understanding of the use of information in what you would call a hybrid environment. Because that's what was happening in the Cold War, was a battle for belief, for influence, and so on. And the Russians were really quite good at it. We were actually not that bad. Um, but at the end of the Cold War, we forgot all the lessons and the Russians continued. And the Chinese are also pretty good at it with concepts like the three warfares and so on. So it's very important that we understand that until the fighting starts full on, your main weapon is strategic communication, a battle of narratives, a battle for trust. Uh, and even after that, you now have a long conflict in Ukraine the willpower of Ukrainians to continue, the willpower of Russians to continue, the influence of the nations around you to carry on supporting you, this is a battle for influence. It's a battle for will. So STRATCOM is incredibly important at all stages, but even more before the guns start firing. In terms of ethicals, um, the, I was a BBC journalist, and the BBC prides itself on its impartiality. Um, but one thing I learned there is that you need, you cannot be neutral between good and evil. You can have a situation where you say, um, well, Winston Churchill says the Germans are bad. Now let's go to Chancellor Hitler and see what he thinks. You know, balance is not he says, she says, it's not all one, it's not finding somewhere in the middle. Balance is about understanding what's going on and putting that over to your audiences. So impartiality is about uh, commitment to being fair. So in my world, 
as a strategic communicator, I am not neutral. I was an employee of NATO. My job was to promote NATO. But I work for democracy, democratic institutions, and therefore I have to live up to certain values. NATO's strategic communication policy has as its number one principle values. So it is completely fair, completely ethical to try and influence somebody. We do it all the time. The clothes we wear, trying to get somebody to go to a Chinese restaurant rather than an Italian restaurant. We're all influencing everybody all the time. But it's about ethical influence. Are we telling the truth? Or are we lying to get our way? And so informing is, is pointless in our world. Informing, we're all trying to influence, and we should, and it's ethical, but we should influence in an ethical manner. We should not lie. We should not mislead. We should not tell people that we are something which we're not. We should, if we say we're going to do something, we should do it. So I, over my years there, became very passionate about what I would call ethical influence. I am an influencer, but I want to do it in a way that when you look at me, you can trust me, that you can see I'm credible. And to do that, I must live up to the values of a democratic society. And sometimes, if, say, NATO bluntly screws up, I've got to say, we screwed up, and not try and pretend we didn't. Because if I try and pretend we didn't, I will lose credibility and I will deserve it. Talking about your credibility, you spent 22 years in journalism, notably 11 years as BBC defense correspondent. Then you became a special advisor to the Secretary General of NATO and uh, continued your career developing strategic communications at the heart of NATO. At which point of your career have you become professionally and personally invested in Ukraine? Um, purely because of the timing um, at NATO. Um, because the, I d had very little to do with NATO when I was a defense correspondent. I mean, it just didn't come across. I had a certain amount to do with the Baltics, with their, um, when they sort of broke free from Russia or from the Soviet Union. And I had a lot to do with the Bal Balkans. But I just didn't come across Ukraine. Um, so I had a, a limited amount to do um, before the first Russian aggression. Um, just keeping across it. But really my investment came after 2014 when the Russian uh, aggression was so clear, when the Ukrainians fought back so clearly. And I also saw how Ukraine changed in that time. And I went to Ukraine a lot. I met Ukrainians a lot. Um, and I saw um, a nation changing itself. I saw a lot of people who understood values often better than people who are more complacent about them. There's nothing which will make you value what you've got better than the clear and obvious threat of losing it. And Ukrainians know what they're for. And I saw the bravery, the commitment, um, and I invested in it because, and you are fighting for us. I mean, you have no choice from whether you're fighting for us is irrelevant. You're going to fight for yourselves. But I am aware that if Ukraine loses, Europe loses. Western democracies lose. It's absolutely fundamental. Um, the biggest losers would be Ukraine. You would be occupied by an authoritarian nation. But the world will lose because it will tell aggressors that you can do what you want and get away with it. It will tell aggressors that the West is not strong enough to stop you. This could be dangerous in China. They would be encouraged to go to Taiwan because the world is looking at them and saying, how committed are you? How committed are you? And unless we do what we need to do for Ukraine, the answer will be not committed enough. So I am personally invested because I admire what's going on. I'm professionally invested because I'm a British 
citizen and I don't want my country to be knocked back because it hasn't done enough for your country. And how do you see how war is going? Well, unfortunately, I think it's going to be a conflict of attrition. Um, it's already in that phase. I do not see Putin in any way pulling back. Um, there is no peace in prospect. He, is, he has demanded um, territory he doesn't control, the demilitarization of um, your army in effect, your neutrality in a way that would leave you vulnerable to him fully taking over. So he is in no way offering anything other than a capitulation to Soviet control, to Russian control. So that's, for Ukraine, it's existential. You cannot give up because if you give up, you've in effect capitulated and you've lost the war. So there is no middle ground here. So I don't at the moment see any way, any pathway to peace. Um, in terms of the progress of the war, um, I'm not seeing any military advantage on one side or the other, which is decisive. At the moment, the balance is possibly a little bit on the Russian side, but not enough for them to take over. Um, and it could easily reverse. So basically, the military situation is attritional. Um, so it then comes back to will. Well, the will on both sides is still there. Um, so I don't see the war ending um, under the current stakes. It might fall into a kind of stalemate, um, but there's not going to be peace and I don't think there's going to be a settlement. And I'm very sad to say that, but that's the tenor of Ukraine has done a brilliant job, um, but it's going to have to keep doing a brilliant job. And what does the victory of Ukraine means to you personally? To me personally, it's, it would be a huge victory for my friends, because I call you my friends now. It would be a huge victory for the West. It would mean that we have, we have taken a time when great powers with malign intent have decided to rise, it would mean that they've been knocked back. So it's an opportunity for us to reset it to the world that we want to be. And for a Ukrainian victory, however it looks to peace, would be to get you in the EU initially, um, and to get peace there so that you can be a major European power, which is what you should be. You're big enough, you've got the talent, um, and you should be a major player in Europe. And that's what I want to see in the end. It's going to be a long while, but Ukrainian people can look ahead. Keep going, keep fighting. You will get there. It might take a while, but it will get there. And then I think you're going to be a force in Europe in a good way. Thank you, Mr. Leiter. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you.